Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses, while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and the host. To kick us off, I'd like to remind you to please visit my website for free resources over at thelastsymptom.com. While you're there, if you'd like to support my overall body of work, which includes this uh, podcast as well as the video, you can do that right from thelastsymptom.com. You can also schedule time to talk one-on-one with me personally if that's something you'd like to do, and maybe I can help you figure some things out. How's your week going? My week is going... Pretty good, except that, you know, around here we often talk about denial and how powerful it is. Well, I personally have been suffering a bit of denial about my vision lately, but knowingly. (laughs) Oh, for about the past year, I figure uh, I've been having some trouble seeing at a distance, And uh, recently, you know, after playing around with my sight for a little bit, uh, I realized that it's my right eye. It's not my left eye. It's just my right eye. So my right eye is having some trouble seeing at a distance. Everything is blurry, but not in my left eye. You know, if I'm looking at in the distance, it's something with my with my right eye closed and I'm looking with my left eye. I can see things crystal clearly, but because my right eye is so blurry it's putting uh, a strain i reckon on my on my left eye so uh, that's what i'm dealing with this week i'm trying to get that fixed don't know if you're going to see me wearing glasses sometime in the future or if i'm just going to stick a contact in the one eye or what what the deal is because i've never had any problems with my sight you know and i i just start really noticing it i've got a pretty big tv but when i'm watching the tv i can't really see the the scores and stuff to know how bad the Red Sox are losing uh, when I'm watching baseball and stuff like that. So uh, that's what I'm dealing with. I'm going to try to get that fixed this week and figure it out. Hope you've been uh, enjoying the fall weather moving in, depending on what part, what part of the world you're in. To get us started today, I shared a story today on the education group, and uh, I thought that it would be uh, constructive to share that with everybody. And the reason why I told this story was because a member of my group uh, mentioned uh, that she was suffering some frustration and depression and going through these various uh, emotional ups and downs and realizations while she was doing the work to uh, recover from her own emotional unhealth. And I kind of wanted to let her know that I could identify with her and to let her know that it's really not um, that unusual what she's experiencing. The story I'm going to tell you is a true story that happened while I was in Arizona. I was in an intensive program there. It was the moment I realized that I was getting, I was my own greatest obstacle to recovery and the feelings that I experienced along with that. So she talked about a lot of her problems being self-inflicted. And here's how, here's what I had to say about that. I said, I remember the experience I had of getting furious at one of the psychologists who was a, a great man in this intensive program that I participated in while I was in Arizona. And I don't remember exactly what it was that the psychologist said, but I do remember he was being direct with me. <laughs> he wasn't uh, softening anything for me and he wasn't beating around the bush. No, he was being pretty direct with the things he, he was saying. 
And I think that that is what really set me off. I don't think it was really anything that he was saying. I think it was his directness and uh, my reaction to that. You know, people who are emotionally unhealthy, it's an ongoing pattern, ain't it? They don't like to be talked to direct, which is why I'm amazed sometimes that I've got uh, so much support here for my work because that's exactly how I talk to you, (laughs) isn't it? Well, on this occasion, I was so pissed off at him. Him sitting across from me, talking to me the way he was. And I mean, I erupted. My my temper went through the roof. I probably looked as red as a beet. And I, I let off on him. Went off on him. I told him exactly what I thought of him. I really let him have it. And I mean, I must have gone on for 10 minutes. And there were 100 million trillion things going through my brain at the time. You know, these thoughts would pop into my head, fleeting, and I didn't do, I didn't act on them. But there are some specific things that I remember thinking. I remember thinking about how good it would feel to hop up out of my chair and just beat the hell out of him. I thought about knocking an ornament off the wall or, you know, knocking a picture off the wall. But what I most considered very, very seriously was just getting up saying to heck with all this, and walking right out of that program and flying back to Philadelphia. You know, in my sick thinking, I thought, well, he's got it coming, and uh, this will make a dramatic statement. <laughs> Stupid stuff. Uh, you know, I, he wouldn't have been out anything. I'd already paid for the, the program. So the only person who was going to be out was me. But I, that's how angry I was. And now I'm not sure what stopped me from doing exactly that, because I'm telling you, I come a hair from doing it. The directness with which he was talking to me um, really put a hair in my biscuit. I was ready to just jump up and say, call it all off. And whatever stopped me from doing this, whatever it was, was a miracle. I think back to this experience often. And I think what it's just a miracle. It's a miracle that uh, that I didn't just jump up and leave. One second, my needle was up in the red, and I mean in the red. And then in the very next instant, I had this flash of insight. And I realized that it really didn't matter if the very... You know, the minutest specifics of what this guy was saying to me were true or false. At that moment, that was not really what mattered. What mattered was this ongoing pattern of me doing things in the hardest way that were bringing me the worst results and yet clinging to that. I didn't know why why was I clinging to that. You know, the, that's the irony. Clinging to doing things in the hardest possible way and getting the worst possible results and yet clinging to that. That was me. And I sort of realized that in that moment, the greatest obstacle to my recovery was not anything else but me. It was just me. That is what was relevant. That I was my own greatest obstacle. Including the anger and my reactions to what I was being told and how I was being told it. It was part of the same old pattern of stuff. My way of doing it. The hardest way. And getting the worst results. Why was I clinging to that? And, and you know, this happened in an instant. It happened in a in a flash of an instant, right as I was about to stand up from this couch and tell that guy to screw himself and I was out of here, this thought hit me. I instantly went from ramped up to 100 to deflated in a second. I actually sank into the chair it was like a balloon 
uh, when all the air escapes out of it. And I know that he saw this too, because I saw it register on his face. He was sitting right across from me, and we were sitting opposite each other, looking at each other, having this conversation. And I'll never forget my next words to him. Word for word, this is what I said. I don't know what I'm doing. I always seem to get in my own way. And uh, I was defeated. I felt very defeated. I felt exhausted, to be honest with you. I could not see how I was going to get better when I myself was the person continuously blocking my own progress. Nobody else but me could drive this car. (laughs) Nobody was ever going to be able to open my door, get inside me, and take over the steering wheel for me. And yet, this reality, paired with the reality that no matter how hard I tried... I seem to continuously get in my own way, trip my own self up, sabotage my own desires and efforts. These two things combined created a really kind of bleak outlook for what I was really hoping to accomplish. So when I said this, when the sudden change happened, and in an instant I went from ready to pounce on this guy or walk out, or knock a picture off his wall. When I went instantly from this to deflated and resigned and sort of helped me, helped me win over myself, he jumped up, came over to the couch where I was sitting, plopped down right next to me, and uh, I can't remember. He, he either put his arm around me or he, uh, he put his hand, his hand on my shoulder. And just kind of gripped my shoulder. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something like, you know, you're on the right path. I, I was where you are once. You're on the right path. That meant a lot to me. What an experience. In one second, both of us tense and staring each other down. Me ramped up and ready to rumble and just going off on him and him standing his ground. And then suddenly, my surrender. It totally surprised me. To this day, I cannot put my finger on why I changed course in that one millisecond of an instant, but I did. And I'm... I'm really relieved that I did because looking back, that was, that was kind of a turning point for my own recovery. You know, uh, we are our own worst obstacles, aren't we? And every single person who gets better manages to overcome themselves I share this story because it seemed relevant to the theme of the uh, post that the person had originally uh, written. Getting in our own way is a normal, expected part of this process, you know, and it can be depressing to realize it, just as I shared the depressing thoughts that uh, I initially had when I realized that uh, nobody would ever be able to get inside of me and take the steering wheel for me. It was up to me. And yet, what was I doing? What had time and time again proven that when it's up to me, I do the wrong thing. I do the hard thing that brings me the worst results. And yet, nobody can take the steering wheel for me. It's got to be me. That was kind of depressing for me. It was kind of depressing Because those two things together seem to point to a hopeless situation. But the situation is not 
not hopeless. Because the same guy you're listening to tell that story or watch and tell that story is the same guy now doing this work, living a, a pretty healthy and content life and sharing these stories with other people to try to help them. The same guy, the same guy who was sitting on that couch ready to once again sabotage everything and get in his own way and prevent his own progress, that same guy is talking to you right now, looking at you right now. Even when you don't exactly see the hows, how you're going to get from here to there, let me be your lighthouse. If nothing else, I can be that. I can be the thing that you see through the fog that tells you you're on the right path. you got to keep doing what you're doing. Keep learning. Keep trying. Keep motivated. Keep enthusiastic. Your enthusiasm, any enthusiasm you're able to generate and maintain, the power of that cannot be overstated now in the past that uh in fact the very name of my work comes from the fact that the last symptom that i experienced personally in my recovery was uh depression so a lot of people think well depression's got to be the thing that uh, i personally can expect to be the last thing to go well not necessarily you know we're all individuals and even though Sharing the same emotional disorder makes people very predictable in the same ways, the same predictable ways. At the same time, the specifics of people's uh, circumstances and lives, intellect, strengths, weaknesses, these are all individual things, right? Unique things to each each person. So uh, it's true that everybody will experience the same things. They'll have to do and accomplish the same things in their recovery. And along the way, they can expect to experience most, if not all, of the exact same things in their lead up to getting there. But the order is not concrete because of all the factors that I just mentioned. You know, people's circumstances, their intellect, their what's going on in their life, the stability in their life or the lack of it. So don't get too hung up on the order in which I talk about things. Instead, focus on uh, the reasons for their necessity or the value, you know, the value behind those things um, occurring at the time when you most need for those things to occur. So a lot of predictability in general mixed with uniqueness when it comes to some of the specifics. But the point, the the reason I'm sharing this story is to uh, encourage everybody, encourage everybody that if you're feeling down, feeling a little overwhelmed, feeling like I don't, I I, I don't see how what I'm doing is ever going to lead me there. That's pretty natural. It's pretty natural. Let me be your lighthouse. And uh, we'll get there together. You know, I have no superpower. I have no super intellect. There's nothing special about me that allowed me to do it. Except for one thing. Willingness. Genuine, sincere willingness. That was the thing that got me here to where I'm at. So as long as you got that, you've got what it takes. You don't have to be a super genius, nothing like that. Now, let's see here. I wanted to take a moment to talk about, uh, in the. I think it was either in the last episode or the episode before, I talked about how humility is uh, recognizing our limits and being content to work within them. The word I probably should have used instead was modesty, because people will confuse humility with humbleness. It's important to notice the, the distinction between humbleness and uh, modesty, or humility. God 
is humble. Humbleness is when we lower ourselves voluntarily to put ourselves on a level with somebody else. So, uh, for example, I always get down to one knee when I talk to my daughter. Here I am, this big grown man with all this life experience, right? When she comes to talk to me, I get down on one knee so that we're eye to eye so that she can feel that I respect the things she, she feels and has to say and that we're on the same level. I'm not superior to her in that moment while we're having that, that conversation. I want her to feel like she has my entire respect and attention in that moment. That is humbleness, and God does that for us. You know, anytime you pray and he listens to a prayer, well, that's, that's God being humble. Anytime he has patience with people who know so little, while he knows everything, and he patiently waits to hear what you think about the situation, even though he doesn't need your opinion, that's humbleness. So in real life, everyday life, a humbleness for us would be, be doing the same thing. You know, for example, like my daughter, getting down, making myself, uh, putting myself down on her level of less experience, le- less knowledge, and yet taking her words and her feelings as seriously as I would take uh, the president of the United States, you know, words and feelings and opinions. Humbleness. Now, modesty is most important for us. We cannot say God is modest because modest is recognizing our limits and working within those limits. Does the creator of everything in the universe have any limits? No, he doesn't. So it cannot be said that God is modest. But for us, especially in recovery, modesty is a necessary requirement because it simply means realistically recognizing what our limits are and being content to work within that boundary. And uh, I was talking to somebody the other night, and I said, well, you might be thinking, would, would we have ever gotten to the moon? Would man have ever gotten to the moon by being modest? And the answer is yes. <laughs> In fact, we did get to the moon being modest. We got there safely and back. Immodesty, the opposite of modesty, would have been saying, well, why stop at the moon? Let's go to Mars. You know, when the technology wasn't even there, we hadn't even been to the moon, had no real accomplishments out in space. That would have been immodesty. So modesty did get us to the moon. It got us to the moon safely. We went when we were ready. We got people there safely, and we got them back safely. Immodesty would have said, well, heck, let's not stop at the moon. Let's go to Mars, and let's go to Mara. And the modest scientists would have said, well, no, heck, listen, we got to do all the – we got – perfect our rockets we got to perfect our math we got to figure this all out so yeah modesty is a beautiful quality it's nothing it doesn't indicate weakness at all it indicates wisdom intelligence so uh, in recovery don't think don't expect yourself to uh, be perfectly cured overnight that's not very modest I it took me seven years. I've told people that I, uh, you know, I think in the right, given the right circumstances, the right personality, the right willingness, that a person might achieve the same thing in two years. But don't think that uh, okay, I'm going to have this thing licked by next week, because then what's going to happen? Well, that immodesty is going to really work against you. Next week's going to come. You're going to still be behaving the same way, and you're going to say, oh, I hate myself. Hate myself. I was supposed to be better by now. (laughs) Immodesty is not doing you any favors. All right? Now, uh, one last thing we're going to talk about here, and then I'm going to wrap it up because I'm trying to keep these things a little bit shorter. 
Another message said, you mentioned that anyone dating or married to someone with BPD, borderline personality disorder, would also be considered emotionally unhealthy. You also mentioned that uh, your ex-wife set boundaries in appropriate ways after finding out about your cheating, which I would assume would be hard for emotionally unhealthy people to do. Because you were together for a long time and seemed to have a relatively normal life, what were some of the signs or symptoms that she ignored throughout your time together? Did she enable you in unhealthy ways? Where do you think her emotional health, unhealth lied or lay? <laughs> Not sure which, which one's right there. She didn't seem codependent by the way you describe her. And she says, I think that these questions are important so that partners or ex-partners of people with BPD that don't seem to have any glare and emotional issues can help themselves look for subtle signs and also get the appropriate help for themselves as well. Good question. This is something I've been wanting to talk about for a while. Let me tell you about Diana, my ex-wife. She was brilliant, unusually brilliant, unusually intelligent. And I often told her that the only person who could, that I ever had met who could hold a candle to her brain was my best friend Jordan, who you've heard me talk about in the past, who was killed in a car accident in 2005. Both of them together could have cured cancer if they'd gotten, gotten together on that. Also, looking back now, even though she was super brilliant and intelligent, I can see many ways in which Diana was emotionally unhealthy. And also, my friend Jordan was emotionally unhealthy. When I look back at him, shortly before the end of his life, he had gone through a divorce. And the fact that he married that woman in the first place was a disaster. It, it was the worst bit of decision-making that anybody could have made. And the results of that bad decision-making just were what they were. You know, they, they became, the results just were what they were. And those results were not good results. So Jordan, for example, he didn't make great decisions. He was a terrible driver. He seemed to choose the view things that were dangerous as nothing to be concerned about at all. I remember that uh, he and I took a walk one time down a highway. And we took walks like this often uh, for conversation. So walking in the middle of the night would give us a chance to get some great conversation. Well, we, because we both lived out in the country, I was at his house, and not far from his house was this highway. And we walked to this highway, and we were walking up it. Cars were zooming by 70 miles an hour. Well, he was walking right on the painted line on the side of the highway. Not a care in the world. Car zooming by. I said, all it takes is one distracted driver, and you're going over the hood. Nah, nah, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. So I had to beg him to please walk off this off the side of the road to eliminate this possibility that you could get clipped by a car. So you'd think... You'd think that a person with such brilliant intelligence, much more intelligent than me, would be able to factor in dangers like this for himself, recognize the seriousness of them, and then make better decisions. But he, he just did not, did not take things like that seriously. Now, Diana, she was able to retain obscure facts and details in her memory after reading or hearing these things just one time. She stored them in this gigantic brain vault of hers and could pull them out whenever she wanted. It was amazing. You know, anybody who played any sort of trivia against her was just destined to lose. Names, dates, places, exactly what happened, who all was involved, all these complex and detailed facts. They, it was really amazing. But now here's the difference between Jordan and Diana. When the extent and the true nature of my emotional unhealth became clear, do you know what was not Diana's uh, default reaction? Her default reaction was not, oh my goodness, Brian has this problem. I have to figure out what his problem is and fix it. We got to get him fixed. Mm -mm. That was not her default reaction. 
Instead, her immediate reaction was, what is wrong with me, Diana? How could I be have lived in denial for so long? And what does that say about me? What is wrong with my emotional health that I could live with this denial? You know, I've spent every day with this person, me, Brian, for 10 years. And the warning signs were everywhere. And here I've just been denying it. I've been in denial. What is wrong with me, Diana? I have to focus on that and fix myself. That was her default reaction when it became clear that I was so screwed up. (laughs) So when it comes down to it, Diana wins the brilliancy award over Jordan. She was right. She wasn't emotionally healthy. You know, she'd come from a home where the issues of emotional unhealth were different than the issues of emotional unhealth in my home. But differently unhealthy is still unhealthy, right? So she had powerful issues of living up to unhealthy, unreasonable expectations of others. She had an unhealthy issue with uh, desiring uh, more than what was healthy to please her mother. And this created great anxiety for her. So she was anxious for a lot of the years of our marriage. And in fact, this surely explains 90% of her denial and tolerance of my emotionally unhealthy patterns for so long. So, you know, her family and friends expected nothing less from her than the perfect, for her to have a perfect relationship. And so this is what she had to present to them. Even when I was making it almost impossible, and it's not as if she were lying to anybody. No, she wasn't lying to them. You see, she wasn't presenting an illusion to anybody that she hadn't already convinced herself of. You see, so she did enable me. She was emotionally unhealthy herself. At the same time, her incredible intellect served her very well when all was put down on the table. She knew the right place to look first, and she made identifying and addressing her own emotional unhealth her first priority. Genius. Absolute genius. This allowed her then to make the best decisions for herself when dealing with me later in the interest of the greatest long-term well-being for both of us. By focusing on her own issues and failings first, she was able to make clear-headed decisions in her relationship with me, her own needs, and my true needs. Not our wants, but our needs. What would most likely affect our long-term happiness and health in the greatest possible way? Genius. She was a genius. And when, you know, when it come down to it, her intellect uh, served her very well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the show I got for you today. I want to thank you for joining me. I want to remind you again of thelastsymptom.com. While you're there, please support my work with a donation, and I appreciate that very much. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one conversation with me, you can do that right from thelastsymptom.com. Well, here we are. We've reached the encouraging finale. Where I'm from, if you get stuck at a train crossing, you curse your life. Why? Because typically you're on your way somewhere and you're running late. And if you get caught at a train crossing... You can expect a 30-minute wait. We don't have passenger trains. Instead, what we do have are cargo trains. And they run 100 cars long. 200 cars long. 500 cars long. Who knows? They just go on forever and ever and ever. When I moved to Philadelphia, and I went out on my first day to work... 
I got stopped at a train crossing. I said, oh my God, I'm never going to get there on time. The train gates come down. They blocked off the, the railroad tracks. And guess what happened next? Thirty minutes there? No, the train came by. Twelve seconds, and the gates came back up. I couldn't believe it. The difference between cargo and passenger trains—incredible. Well, that was just one of many culture shocks that I experienced when I moved to the big city. But isn't it interesting how our perspectives, uninformed, can create expectations? That are not based on reality. Education and new experience can broaden our perspectives, so that our expectations become more fine-tuned and accurate. Mm-hmm.